Uh, I listened to a few of your podcasts. They're very clinical. I won't be talking. About that. <laughs> you listen no. to the really clinical ones. Then. <laughs> I listen to most of them where they're like, you know, nurses or whatever. And like, uh, I won't be talking about that. <laughs> uh, Alan, we got to cut all the clinical questions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Half the questions are gone, Ned. <laughs> Robert Ritlop is currently the Director of Investments at MedTech. He oversees a $14 million fund for direct investments in innovative health technology companies across Canada. Robert is passionate about health technology, the democratization of access, and the cutting edge. Robert is a lifelong learner, an entrepreneur, and an investor. He holds a B.Eng. and an M.Eng. degree in mechanical engineering from McGill University and an MBA in entrepreneurship, strategy, and finance from New York University's Stern School of Business. Robert started his career as an aerodynamicist in Montreal, then went on to co-found Oculogica, a New York City-based medical device startup, and the first non-invasive baseline-free aid in the diagnosis of concussion to pass through the FDA de novo pathway. More recently, Robert was also the Director of Business Development at the MedDev Commercialization Center, where he focused on investing in medical device startups. Robert, I think I speak for Josh here, but we are so grateful to have you on the show today. Welcome to the show, Robert. My pleasure. It's my first pod. Um, hopefully, it's a good one. Awesome. And by the way, uh, full disclosure, uh, Robert is uh, an investor in Seamless through MedTech and a board member as well. So all the nice things he says about Seamless uh, are I'm true. Nice. But- <laughs> <laughs> so thrilled to be working with you, Robert, and looking forward to all your insights today. My pleasure. Happy to be here. Listen, like I said, I was, it should be a lot of fun. Um, you know, I, li- I love sort of sharing my thoughts on on sort of my viewpoints and how we think and how I think personally. So, you know, it's really, you know, how I view see the market. I love to share that with some of your folks. Amazing. Actually, Robert, maybe a, a good place to start because your background is so diverse and, and you come from, you know, an entrepreneur back tra- a background and now you've kind of positioned yourself in investing in health tech. Um, what kind of spurred that transition or why did you transition from working in health tech to now investing in health tech? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, the, the short background is like the way I got into health was a bit serendipitous. So it was kind of one of those moments where everything kind of converged into one nice sort of moment in time. So, you know, I had the technical background engineering. I did aerospace back in Montreal. You know, I made flight simulators fly pretty much for, for helicopter simulators. Came to the, went to New York to do business school. Um, so basically the tech background, the business school, and actually the third piece was me actually experiencing a pretty, pretty bad concussion, like in 20, 2008, actually. So having understood what it means to be concussed and having those other two pieces, I met this surgeon through this kind of blind dating sort of setup at business school. Um, we, we sort of matched um, and then we, uh, you know, applied to the business school uh, business plan competition together and we managed to win it. So I stuck around from there on out. Um, and you know, that moment in time, that serendipitous sort of moment got me into healthcare for the first time ever. So it's sort of spinning away, like going into the future, um, you know, came back to Canada cause uh, like all other Ottawans, um, our wives tend to work here. <laughs> so um, I moved over, moved back home uh, to Canada um, and then found a similar sort of minded healthcare uh, organization that eventually spun into some investing. Um, and, you know, as you know, a lot of investors tend to have operational backgrounds, um, which does help in the day to day on picking and choosing or trying to understand or get into the heads of various entrepreneurs. So that's why I sort of, that's how, that's my journey. Um, so about three years into the med, the med tech journey uh, specifically, um, and as you probably know, no, noted before, you know, we are a, a fund for Canadian companies. Uh, we are federally funded. So we want to sort of grow the Canadian pie as much as, as much as possible. Hey, hey Robert, quick question for you. Um, you know, you've kind of lived both sides of the table as an operator and as investor. Um, what do you miss most about being an operator? Yeah, I think about that a lot, honestly. Um, you know, the, the actual, so investing is basically you're doing paper, you're, you're doing paperwork, you're in a desk job, you're kind of remote, especially now you don't have a lot of for a touch and feel. Um, I miss building stuff, honestly, um, getting into the sort of weeds, getting down into code. Sometimes I kind of miss that too. Um, 
and sort of meeting with folks, meeting with other, you know, customers or patients and saying, hey, I have this great thing, like, you know, do you want it? Do you want to pay for it? Can I fix this thing for you? And then you get that sort of gratification, that sort of higher touch and like, yeah, I built something at the end of the day. So I don't really get that right now, but this is a bit different where I get to see a lot of diverse things. Um, I get to see a lot of, you know, different topics and a very, very high level sort of strategic thought processes, you know, especially being on boards and stuff like that. So it's very different, but sometimes balance is always what you need in life. Um, I don't have a ton of sort of low level things where I came from. So it's, it's kind of always something I think about. You know, you mentioned how being on both sides of that equation, being an operator and then being an investor, has actually helped you almost get into the mind of uh, potential health tech startups and, and their uh, leadership teams and understanding their problems uh, more from kind of that balanced equation. Are there anything in, are any, any specifics that you look for uh, in terms of a health tech startup? Are there particular metrics or, or leadership skills that you value the most in, in early stage uh, startups? Yeah, this, um, so the venture game is, you know, when one of my profs at B-School, um, Professor Oaken, he did a lot of investing also as well. And, you know, he had, we took a class, it was kind of a venture class, sort of. Um, and he basically said, like, look, you can't learn venture in a class, you got to do like 10 deals with me. Hmm. And turns out that's kind of true, because doing this whole venture thing, you really got to just see a ton of examples and kind of learn from them and figure out what makes sense. So along those lines, to answer your question, like we really do look at team and sort of the, the leadership and are they balanced and are they executing? And that's really the top most important thing. Um, you know, Josh, are you making the right decisions? Did you make the right decisions five years ago? Did they age well? Like all of that kind of is important. And then it also reflects back on me as the investor coming in on let's say 2020, right? Am I going to give you some exotic and crazy terms for investing that someone five or two to five or 10 years from now are like, what the hell was this guy thinking? He screwed the, he screwed the company over by doing something a bit too esoteric. You know, why did Josh allow that to happen? So we look for, for, for Josh, people like you, like with balanced, balanced heads, making good decisions, making sure that you're doing the right thing, steering the ship in the most honest way possible so if you're too selfish it'll come it'll show and it'll kind of be like oh what's this about um if you're too sort of timid or conservative that's no good either right so it's all it's all about the entrepreneur themselves and then it's about the product and the market do you have traction um is it a me too or is it innovative um, all that stuff, but really there's so much variety that everyone's different. It's hard to always, you know, all the VC panels are like, what do you look for in companies? It's usually different, but it, the basics are, you know, does the product make sense? Is there a market? Does someone want to pay for it? Is there a fit? Are people actually going to adopt it and use it? So adoption is massive. Mm -hmm. And like, I saw your prep questions and I might want to go into a rant about adoption Canada later on, because um, there's a lot of sort of frustration there too. Um, I digress, but it's different again. It also matters on the stage. So you guys are more mature. We look at younger companies as well, and they usually get more benefit of the doubt. Uh, Robert, I want to ask you about the, the way that you would look at venture differently between um, a healthcare venture versus a maybe a more generic software venture. Because I think one of the things that I found in the fundraising process is that uh, investors like yourself who have deep domain expertise in healthcare got really excited about certain things in our company where that other investors who don't have healthcare expertise like didn't value as much or didn't didn't really understand why that was so important or exciting. Um, so I'd love to get your take on like the differences you see between how you look at investment as a healthcare investor versus like what you think a lot of traditional investors miss when they're looking at healthcare deals. It's a completely different animal. Period. Like when I was back doing it, doing it in your shoes, um, you know, I always said I had a sixth sense, right? It was like you sniff out the, the health VC versus the non-health VC, like right off the bat. Like in my previous incarnation, like, you know, is your thing an app? I'm like, dude, it's a medical device. <laughs> like it's not an app. Um, so different ballpark altogether. Um, you know, the sales cycles are longer. It's such a pain to get Actually, I'll back up. The biggest problem, the biggest difference between a healthcare product and like a B2B 
company, uh, B2B product, is that you do not have the luxury of just releasing something into the wild and fooling around with it. Mm-hmm. You got to freeze it. No, spend $3 million, freeze it, try it. If you screw up your clinical trial, you probably have to spend more money and a lot more time to fix it. Basically, there's a lot less room for mistakes. It's a lot more expensive. And your sort of feedback loop is, is super delayed. It's even worse if you're regulated. Like you guys aren't regulated, so you have the benefit of sort of tweaking things or doing sort of, um, you know, picking a cohort or a segment and saying like, let's fool around, guys. Let's sort of try this. Do you like it? Do you don't? Um, medical hardware, like, forget it. It's tough. Um, you got to spend a lot of money and a lot of effort up front, and you don't even know if you have product market fit. So those are the main differences. Aside from that, like it's regulatory, um, healthcare minds and willingness to pay and who pays for what is very different as well, um, especially up here in Canada. You know, so it's a huge market, but it's kind of fragmented, but the who pays for things is kind of messed up because the government pays here. Mm-hmm. So that's why, you know, we usually tell our portfolio companies like, go to the States. The market here is small. Um, Getting someone to pay for it is really, really hard. Whereas down there, like at least, you know, Kaiser has their own, they pay their own bills. It's not like the government, unless it's Medicare or CMS. But um, again, all of those sort of different stakeholders really skew things and how business is done. Versus, you know, B2B, it's like, okay, you want to buy my thing? Great. You know, pay me something like per month or per year. Yeah, I think you made a really great point there about kind of how quickly you get a product to market in healthcare versus generic B2B. And I think, um, you know, people often talk about, you know, getting a minimal viable product in the hands of of customers and users. But I think in healthcare, um, it's closer to you have to have a minimal sellable product or maybe even like a level above that, you know, minimal minimally sellable and safe let me, product. <laughs> let me explain to your viewership how this works and how bananas it is versus let's say, you know, it's funny when I was like, just kind of fooling around with like a B2C product for fun as a side product, side project. Um, you know, you can just mock it up on like Envision or whatever and show it to someone on the street and you're done. I'm like, there's no way in healthcare you can actually do that. Like maybe if you're just in your in your office, but forget it. After that, like you can't just do this like like with an iteration wheel. Like, but so to your point, hey viewership, this is how it works in healthcare. Have an idea, you build something, you spend a bunch of money up front, and then you're probably stuck selling to academics. Academics have no interest in buying your thing or letting you scale. They want to try it. They want to write papers. So you have to sell to academics. They, the way they pay for things is with grants. So that whole payment structure is difficult to begin with because you're begging for cash that, you know, they're begging for cash and then you're begging them for the same cash. It's not like people are generating money and saying, hey, you're solving my problem, like I'll buy your product. It's sort of a different mindset. So once the healthcare company sort of has enough, enough of those, you graduate and you hopefully sell to real companies or real hospitals or real clinics. And then you're stuck doing pilots. Unfortunately, in this business, in our game, it's a necessary evil. You know, fine, do the pilot, but make sure you, at the end of the day, you're gonna get something out of it. Um, I've seen so many companies that have taken the opportunistic, like are too opportunistic and say, hey, look, I've done like 30 pilots, but my revenues are like nothing, you know? So yeah, I mean, the game is different. You gotta, it's a longer path longer path to selling. Um, hopefully you're stuck. Usually your customers are way stickier. So if you look like a, you know, Bessemer just released their investment memos for all the most amazing sort of, um, you know, SaaS, B2B SaaS companies recently. So I live next to Canada's most valuable company, uh, Shopify. I, I read theirs pretty deep in, in detail. Even their churn, like they lose like almost half of their, you know, or at least they did, uh, half of their sort of um, accounts like within a few months or something. Versus healthcare companies, you usually almost never lose them. So that's the difference. So different altogether, a lot stickier, um, a lot longer to close the deal. 
Um, sometimes the contracts are worth more. It really depends how things are structured. Um, but overall, different animal, like different mindset, a lot more patience, patient, a lot more upfront cost, a lot less flexibility to just change anything. So you need to understand that from an investor point of view and say, okay, like, look, I'll invest. You're doing a clinical trial. Fine. I kind of know you're going to have to tweak something. Or if you do, like I realize it's going to be expensive, but it's probably not terrible. Um, whereas let's say a B2B person might be like, holy crap, you got you need to raise another $3 million because you like your sort of testing date has to shift by three months. Like what the hell? Um, so that's normal for us. It's just a different ballpark. I think you brought a good point about actually the grants. I think one, one of my, my beefs actually about, about grants is that I think um, you can get a grant to study pretty much any research question you want, but then that doesn't tell you if there's really a problem that like the hospital um, is willing to pay for. And the only way to find that out is to actually see if the hospital will buy the product, but then the grant doesn't tell you that answer. And that's where you, the entrepreneur, has to keep a really tight rein on things. Grants are great. We have them. It's part of our business. It's like this, yeah, one of three more or less business units that we have, okay? Non-dilutive is fantastic, but you, the entrepreneur, have to use it wisely. What do I mean? Don't just do it because it's a grant. Like, free money is money, but then if you're, do, if you're going off in like a U-turn or sort of going down path that's not going to get you to revenue, it's not helpful. So you as the entrepreneur have to say, hey, look, I have this pocket of money. It's free or it's non-dilutive, not non-repayable, non-dilutive cash. So it's, this, it's the dream. How do I use this properly? So basically, if you are able to steer this grant project, because it's always a project, it's never just give me the money. I'll do what I want with it. If I can steer this project to somehow build something that's core to my platform, if you're doing software or hardware or whatever, it doesn't really matter. Core to my platform, that's going to drive value and let's say at least medium to long term. Let's do it. Let's do it wisely. And let's make sure we're aligning everyone on board because, hey, look, you're a business. Your bottom line is cash. You have a P&L. You got to pay, bot, pay lunches. At the end of the day, your equity has to get beef, like no $1 today and $10 like in tomorrow, for example. But then you're doing projects with universities where their currency are papers. So it's kind of never super aligned. So it's your job as the entrepreneur to say, hey, I need to do this smartly. I need to sort of align everybody to say, we're going here, guys. I want to develop this. I want to make sure this is benefiting our business. So that's the starting point. I'll take a breath. <laughs> I spoke to another customer. So grants are great. And if you get all that right, it's, it's amazing. And your investors will love you for it because at the end of the day, it's less dilution, right? Um, so the next, I guess, ask, you know, if anyone sort of upstairs is listening, let's do some grants. I love it. But when you're done, you know, feed me some sort of commercial contract or give me some sort of really like, legit stamp of approval saying, Hey, I did my work at Sunnybrook. I have this really nice plaque certification saying I meet this standard of some kind of RFP process. So it's legit. And I've sold to this many services within the hospital. And then you go from there. Let's say they, the service tries your thing. They don't like it. You bounce. Great. And you can go somewhere else and say, hey, look, I'm at a government level RFP. I'm legit. Right. So I think that would be the next step. Um, you know, again, these are my opinions only, not my employer. But um, like even things like government grants, like why not take equity in the business? It's the downside is the same. The upside is like everyone can get more money at the end of the day. So there's a lot of ways that I think can sort of uh, really align incentives a little bit better because right now, unless you're smart and you know how to do things and you know how the system works, you can kind of meander off into the, into the, into the field and sort of get lost. So um, we, we definitely look at that, you know, grants are great. So I think you've got a nice one that you just sort of locked in. Um, maybe you can tell the folks about it. It's a great time to sort of uh, <laughs> fix your business, but um, 
you know, from what I understand, I think you positioned yourself properly. And so we see that. We say, hey, Josh, I see what you did there. This makes sense for, you know, the business commercially, let's say a year, two, three, whatever from now, you know, another one of our portfolio companies did something very similar. You know, net net is not going to make them money, but medium to long term, like Jesus, it's going to make them like their value is going to go through the roof. Okay, so if you let it, if you set it up properly, it's amazing. Yeah, you know, I think that's a great point, Robert. And I think I, I liked your comment about if you're going to use grants, be very intentional about about what milestone is going to help you achieve. And I, I think we've seen some companies in our space because they're they're having trouble um, selling their core product, they then try to just take whatever grant they can get, even if they're frankly just doing random stuff to 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 get to get funding that way. And then if you're too distracted from your core product, it's like, what are you working on? Um, because to be honest, like if you can't sell your core product, it could be telling that there's no market for it and getting random grants might just be, you might be just kind of deluding yourself that, that there's something still there potentially. And I think that's a risk in healthcare because cycles are so long, feedback cycles are so slow and all that. Um, I, I did want to get um, back to kind of your, your investing at, at MedTech and uh, not to be too self-serving, but but love to, to get your feedback on like what got you excited about but Seamless in the first place. So, um... I listened to a lot of rap as a kid, so I think you guys are probably one of the OGs of patient engagement in Canada. <laughs> so, um, you know, the first time I met you guys and I saw your kind of back end or when you open the kimono a little bit and say, hey, look, these are my numbers. I'm like, oh, man, these guys have been around for like a while and they're not dead yet. And there's been a lot of Canadian companies that have tried this and just aren't even close. Um, so your revenue numbers were pretty nice. Uh, like you've been around for a while. You've obviously been steering the ship in a responsible way. And that was my initial like first blush reaction to be perfectly transparent. Um, so, I mean, beyond that, I think it's all about workflows. Okay. So I don't like to think about like, you have a great tech. I mean, that's not what you are. You are a workflow optimizer if you really want to think next level or more sort of into what's going on. Like if you went to whatever hospital you're saying, hey man, or hey woman, I've got this great thing called Seamless. It's a piece of tech. It'll make your post-cardiac something or other awesome. But let's say you're focusing on this much of the workflow. Who cares? You need to fix the whole workflow. And that's where the money is. And that's where the sort of pain point is. And that's where they, you know, they bleed money and pun intended, um, you know, and you have to, and you as a SaaS company have to come in and fix it. Um, so to that point, like I read a nice little medium thing, you know, Michelle Kaleran from Omer's, you know, she seems to be doing amazing. Uh, she wrote something on, on construction. So they're basically saying like, look, construction, so they're saying the thing about construction. I'm like, oh man, this sounds a lot like healthcare. Um, so she basically says like, hey, look, SaaS company, you have to fix workflow, workflow problems. Um, you know, that's obvious. You need to make sure that you're improving the overall level. You're saving them money. Your length of stay is, is reducing. And like you guys have some great numbers there. You know, again, toot your own horn if you want. Um, that's super important for you. And as a health investor, I look at length of stay. And like, what does that mean? It means money. Come on. Like if you have to save someone money, if at the end of the day, it's a business health in the, in the States is a business up here. It's more of a public good. That's the difference. Right. Um, but that affects the business. That's why businesses in Canada don't really sell healthcare businesses in Canada don't really sell to Canadian hospitals. Um, and that's kind of why, because the willingness to pay is weird and it's basically zero because we all have free healthcare. And the government pays. So the payments thing is odd, and that's why the States is more attractive. But more on that later if you want to get into it. Um, but it's not about the tech, it's about the workflow. And so basically every other company I'm going to be looking at going forward is like, how are you fixing their workflow? Is it better? You know, you can probably tell some more stories when you have to go into whatever hospital and, and you have probably had like five, ten, maybe more meetings with C-suite. Then you got to meet the quality guys, the IT guys. Like, is your 
platform going to screw up their clinical workflow? And that's what they care about. And if you don't, great. If you improve metrics along the way, I love it. You know, I was listening to your other pod. You know, I, I forgot who it was, but she was saying between 30, and two, 30 minutes and two hours per week. You know, by probably B2B standards, that's like not interesting, right? But for healthcare, it's like, okay, this is something. <laughs> you know? Very true. So um, as long as you guys can sort of, you know, as a business, elevate the game on workflow for health as a SaaS company, like that's what we love about it. Um, and the fact that you've gotten to where you were with like the various, the relatively weaker lo uh, local market in which you grew, in which shaped you, I mean, says something for us. And that's kind of what we keyed into first. And second came the traction, the, let's say, unit economics that you guys posted, mm -hmm. the revenues, the product market fit. So those are kind of how it cascaded in terms of what I liked about Seamless. Awesome. Thank you, Robert. I really appreciate you saying that. Yeah, Robert, it's interesting you talk about how, you know, you're looking at it more as does this optimize the workflow for the individual, for the team? Uh, and I think it's neat because right now with COVID-19, everybody's workflow has kind of shifted and, and it's been turned on its head. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering, has COVID-19 affected the types of businesses you're looking at in healthcare or are there certain ones that are more attractive now, like digital patient engagement or some that are maybe less attractive? I sincerely hope companies like yours can get a, fi a lift finally. Like, look, all these telehealth, telehealth companies were struggling like only like, what are we now, September, 10 months ago, or nine months ago, rather. Um, you know, certain big box sort of telehealth companies raised financing rounds to go tackle other continents. Let's think about that. Okay. And all of a sudden they're saying, hey, let's go public. What does that mean? A pandemic had to happen for business models to become viable. Like, what is that? Like, that's not a way to operate usually in business, right? So I hope it sticks around. I hope we wake up. Um, I read a CMA infographic the other day about like, you know, Canada's warming up to telehealth. Okay, awesome. Do you know which one is the, the leading telehealth method? Is it phone call? <laughs> <laughs> it's the fax machine's older cousin. It's the freaking phone call, guys. Like I'm looking at all these cool things like you like seamless and you know various telehealth platforms like Zoom style things where you know you can meet folks and have these EMRs in the background and doing tele whatever. Canadians want to pick up the phone. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I hope it I hope so, it's I, I, I wanted to just comment on that because like so my, my, my brother's a family physician here and so he's doing more more you know telehealth and by that I mean phone calls um, and uh, you know I asked him kind of his thoughts on like you know does he think this would be sustained you know post pandemic assuming we can get a you know successful vaccine and get back to more in-person stuff and he says well if the reimbursement models stays the way where you get paid more to do in-person things uh, and there's still a lot of fee for service like docs are going to ask patients to come back in again um, so you just kind of hit the nail, the, the nail on the nose there so the way things are paid for in Canada and in the States affects the way things roll out. So up here we have, you know, top down paying, we have government paying for things, then the hospital has budgets and then they only pay for certain things. And that's usually the lowest price for whatever. Right. Um, it's also, like you said, per like procedure value based is starting to get big, better in the States. I don't think we've got it up here yet. So if your folks don't know what value based, it's basically saying like, I take care of, I make sure I take care, take care of somebody like properly so they don't come back. But if they do, I get penalized for it financially in a nutshell. Um, so yeah, I mean, the way things are paid for are gonna affect the way people do things. The way people are trained are gonna, you know, affect the way people are doing things. Um, the systems they have available are gonna affect the way they operate. You know, I had a GP visit over the phone. Great, it was a vast improvement about, you know, driving to the thing, parking, going to wait for like, you know, 
at least at this place, it uh, you get you get called on time. But back in my in, in Montreal, I always has to wait forever at least to see the doc. But um, I asked for an email, and they didn't email it; they mailed it. So it all really depends, like what they've got to work with, what they're comfortable with, and how they get paid. And yeah, if they still get paid higher for in person, then like you know, GPs are always are still complaining about not being paid enough. You know, what is it, 40, 60, whatever dollars per, per visit versus like something higher for like doing a surgical inpatient type of thing, right? So why would I use the phone versus seeing them in person where the same effort can get me like X more dollars? So, so I'll tell you this hilarious image I saw on Twitter, uh, I think last month. Um, so this is during the pandemic. And uh, this is a true story. Apparently there was a, a patient who was asked to come into the office in the waiting room. And then the physician calls the patient from the waiting room um, so that way they wouldn't have to see them in person, but that way, so they wouldn't be in contact, oh, but they could bill them for the in-person visit. It was, it was oh. so bad. <laughs> but that's incentive for you, you know? I, I don't think that's mm -hmm. common, but I think, I think it kind of illustrates the... I'm going home. That's, that's, that's <laughs> terrible. Come on. <laughs> that's bad. Yeah. But yeah, to your point, you know, I hope this fix, I hope this elevates the game, you know, in, in what I do day to day, I think I see things that are probably 10 years out and I always get reminded. It's a stark reminder whenever I actually sort of see what's on the front lines. Um, you know, I'm pretty bullish on like CDS. So CDS, so clinical decision, this is decision support type of platforms. Um, I'm pretty bullish on them. There's still, you know, there's a lot of bumps and a lot of roadblocks on the, on the, on the go to market for those types of products. But Basically what those are like, you know, using software or using AI or using something, you know, um, to help doctors make decisions to ultimately democratize health. So in my intro there, that's why I'm bullish on that because, you know, democratizing health will help a lot of people. Um, so I always have, I always thought about this example because of my background. So when we were building airplanes, it was never like one individual with centralized decision-making and or uh, power, like running the show, AKA in healthcare. When you build airplanes, like man's testament to like, you know, define gravity. When you build it, when, you, when, when Elon Musk build, builds his like uh, his spacecraft, it's not one person. It's an army of like smart people doing things together, right? Um, so the technology, because it's so complex, you need all these bodies, all these brains, um, and you need a lot of people to do it. In healthcare, it's still crazy centralized into these individuals, right? I know there's a lot of, these days, there's a bit more, you know, nurse practitioners, so they can do a lot more things, or nurses are offloading them somehow. Uh, you're always gonna hear stories on how nurses have more sort of uh, patient awareness or because they're around more, they can do things, but they're still not credential to do it. Um, so we're taking some of that away, and but making it still safe and sort of efficacious for other folks to do similar tasks that don't need to be bottlenecked into in one individual. I think that's the way the future should be. Um, you'll save on wait times, you'll save on costs, you'll save on a lot of stuff. I mean, fine, you need a surgery, there's no way around it. You need the surgeon to cut your cut the whatever. Like, that's fine. You want them to be good, great. But for a lot of other things that aren't sort of like acute in the moment, like decision making, like with in real time, like in milliseconds, like you can do a lot of, you can democratize most of it. And that's where I hope things will go. And some of our portfolio companies are working in that direction. And um, for me, that's the future of health. Do you, Robert, do you um, when you think about the companies that, that you're like evaluating or investing in, um, so I, I think your like, medtech has a pretty broad thesis around healthcare. Um, are, are there certain like do, is there a thesis for certain sectors you're focused on, or, or are you actually like broad and you're willing to look at anything in, in the medtech space? We're a bit more opportunistic, but we we, we tend to like certain areas, obviously, because we're human, right? Um, so uh, from a mandate point of view, we invest in Canadian businesses uh, doing work in Canada to sort of you know, make them more marketable and global, for example. So I will never invest in a European or an American business. If you want to go to the States, that's perfectly fine because at the end of the day, you're growing Canada's sort of know-how. So, I mean, that's important because, um, you know, 
I mean, it's the same for all businesses. Um, you know, management is always like tough to find, like great management is tough to find, talent is hard to find. And if we have more success stories, you know, and, and you know, let's say you exit your business, you know, you might start another one or your employees that got, are fairly senior might start another one. So their smarts plus their like, you know, windfall of cash in the bank will help new and smarter businesses to sort of pop up. Um, so that's the dream and that's what we're sort of here to promote. Um, like we are the standard like GPL, GPLP funds. So that's, you know, that's we're a little bit different than let's say the rest. Um, but we are agnostic to sort of area. Um, you know, we're trying to sort of pick, we're a lot more choosy these days for sure though. Is that because of, um, like, because you're later, you're later kind of on in your, your fund deployment, or is it more that, like, because of COVID, that changes how you're we're looking? We're smarter at it? now. We're farther um, down the road. Um, we want to sort of, um, we know what works better and what doesn't. Uh, we've also pivoted a few times internally, just like any, you know, we're kind of a startup ourselves. Um, so, but we also want to give the chance to sort of like great companies to make it to the finish line, right? Because I mean, there's a couple of ways to think about it. You can either seed everything or you can seed people who can actually make it through the finish line. Um, and then like the knock on effect, like I just sort of elaborated upon, you know, could actually be stronger, you know, like my old boss, like was, uh, what was he? The chief regulatory or science officer for a company called Cryocath. They did sort of, uh, they basically grew their business they exited to Medtronic. And then all of a sudden, the, those execs started starting new businesses. And so that's the way like you want it to go. So um, it, we balance it. So we, we do a bit, we do like really early stage stuff. And we try to pick a few winners, obviously, to balance things off. Uh, because at the end of the day, we want success for, you know, one team. Gotcha. That makes sense. Robert, I. I you're so full of insight and opinion. And so I would love to ask you, uh, it's a rather contrarian question, but what is one thing that you believe uh, that others in healthcare or health tech investing would maybe find insane? Uh, I guess back to what I was saying before that maybe it's becoming possible to grow a healthcare business in only Canada. Because six months ago, forget it. I mean, um, it, the market here is, is, is relatively small. I mean, having said that, it, it'll still gonna take a lot of effort for um, companies here to do that and policy, regula regulatory and policy sort of head, like tailwinds need to happen, right? Um, like it's, it, it's tough up here. So, I mean, I'm ragging on this on purpose because people are already doing it. And I just want to take a shot across the bow to really sort of reinforce it. So here's the short story or genesis or history, at least as I know it. You know, companies up here have a tough time. I went to a, uh, an event in Waterloo once and Armin from IntelliJoint, the CEO of IntelliJoint, basically said, got on stage and he's like, look, guys. I love living here. I grew up here. My business is here. My employees are here. All that great stuff. I've used all the grants, all that. But hey, check it out. Like 98% of, of my sales are to the States and Australia. Like 1% or 2% is local, Canadian. So that sort of caught sort of, that snowball kind of grew. He later got onto the, the health uh, strategy table there. It's a couple years old at this point. Um, basically the strategy tables are the same thing. Adoption is really hard here. So that went fine. You know, people, I guess, started to listen. The CAD Health Network all of a sudden became, uh, was born. Uh, we have a competing, let's call it product called Beachheads. Um, you know, competition. I mean, we're all trying to achieve the same thing, but we're different. We seem to be a bit more uh, regionally east versus CAN Health versus a little bit more west, but we have the same intentions in mind. So overall adoption here is really hard. So maybe let's be contrarian and say maybe we could actually build something here up, up north and say, hey, 
you can have viable businesses at least the seed market that sort of like gets a you know a decent sort of uh p l going and then sort of branch out that'll be my contrarian view so let's let's level let's raise the game like let's try to get this done um you know let's have some hospitals adopting some of our local tech i mean all of these like even your project that you just got the big one um super cluster funded like those with the mission in life of super clusters i am is in part to sort of improve this um so adoption is massive is a massive pain point up here so i'll take the positive glass half full and say hey yeah maybe that's possible now i love that robert and it's funny because like um, um I, i've been kind of invited to a number of different um you know round tables around canadian healthcare innovation and these roundtables are usually run by by government folks. Um, so the, the intent is there, right, to try to understand how do we better uh, grow adoption of Canadian-made healthcare innovations um, into our own healthcare system. And every time the question is, how do we get more adoption? And my answer is always change the reimbursement model. If you change incentives, um, people will magically adopt new things that match a new incentive. So if you want people adopting solutions that improve health outcomes, incentivize improving health outcomes. Um, but if you're not gonna change the incentives, I don't know why they think anything would change around adoption. I mean, frankly, the reason why we're seeing, you know, more adoption in the US is because like you mentioned, Robert, the value-based care incentives are much stronger in the US. Um, they, they are more run like a business, so they actually care to reduce length of stay financially. Um, and then also there's like the shift we're seeing towards consumerism in healthcare, particularly in the US, where a, an American healthcare system is thinking about how do I actually attract patients um, beyond my local geography? Like, like I think Kaiser imagines, hey, how do we use um, you know, digital technology to support patients across half the country and not just California? Whereas I think in Canada, we still very think a lot about kind of local communities. Like we only serve those within the you know two kilometer radius. And I'm, I'm not saying that that's a bad thing, but it's more like it's a very different mindset and model in the US where there's true competition on outcomes and, and patients. Whereas here is very much, I think, a little more fluffy uh, in terms of outcomes and, uh, and market. So, I mean, for your viewership who don't already know this fun fact, there are 10 markets up here. There's not one, there's 10 at least. Why is that? So let's say you have a device, you got to get reimbursement. Otherwise you're not going to get paid for your surgical tool. You got to go to 10 payers and say, can you please pay for my thing? It's not like a, you know, a free market where you say like, this is my product. This is what I, this is retail price. Okay. Wholesale is this, why don't, do you want it? Whatever you want to try it first. Fine. Like it's really, it's tough. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're also very conservative up here. I mean, having spent three years in the States and moving back, it was like, whoa, like now I know some of the, why so many people make fun of us, um, you know, aside from apologizing all the time at the airport lines, you know, um, it's, you know, to the PM's point and uh, my local billionaire over here, um, you know, we need more swagger, right? We're too humble. We don't, we're, we're not sort of as ambitious as our friends downstairs. And that reflects in the way we do healthcare too. And just to drive it home, like the conservatism in healthcare is so conservative that we're really using technology that is, you know, five, 10, 15 years old. You know, my personal story is that I had to get a surgery done uh, 2016 or 17 at this point, spine surgery. There I said it. Mm -hmm. In Canada, the standard of care is fusion, right? What does that mean? You're the doctor, tell the people what's, what's a fusion. So as a non-spinal surgeon specialist, I'm assuming there's a there's some sort of fusion of the vertebrae. <laughs> so basically what you're doing in a spinal fusion is that you're you're basically taking a piece of metal and let's say a bunch of screws and you're screwing two vertebrae together. Okay. So it immobilizes it, it you basically take out the so in a in a hernia, what happens is that the nucleus the, um, the annulus usually ruptures or the nucleus or vice versa or both. And you got to get get it out of there because it's impinging on nerves and you have pain and, and so on and so forth. Um, standard of care in Canada is a fusion. So what do you mean? You, you take it out, you basically screw the vertebrae together. So you lose mobility. Um, you know, as I've learned, like loss of mobility equals pain equals over time, you know, it just gets worse and worse and worse. Mm -hmm. 
you know, as a 30 something year old, at the time I was what, 33, like, why would I want to screw my vertebrae together? Like I have all this life to live, like, come on. Um, so I had to, I went to Europe to get what we call like an artificial disc um, done. We don't do it here. Like I had to call suppliers and I said, hey, who's doing it in Canada? Oh, there's these two people, okay. I call them, one's like, no, I guess I was in Ontario at that point, so he was in Quebec, because like, he's like, no. The Ontario one's like, you don't meet criteria. I'm like, what are you talking about? This is a perfect criteria, because he was doing a trial. I go to Europe, the guy's been doing it for like 10 years, right? So different regulatory, different everything. I had to pay for it, like it was basically medical tourism, but you know, I'm fortunate enough to be able to afford it and to know about it. The average patient wouldn't know about that. That comes back to democratization of health. What did I have to do to learn about this? I had to know from my previous job that you have to call the suppliers to figure out which surgeons are awesome. First. Second of all, I had to have some engineering or insight on what makes better sort of sense fixating something that's not meant to be fixated or having something that replicates natural function. So that's why democratization of health is so important to me because the average Canadian would never have been capable of following that process. Um, but sort of making things more accessible in a safe and efficacious way, of course, like you don't want to sort of undermine that. But at the same time, like, don't wait 15, 20 years, like, after sort of folks are starting to use this thing to say, okay, we'll think about it. And it also comes back to pay for it because they're more expensive than fusions, right? So why would Canada pay for something like that? Well, according to the studies is arguably similar outcomes or I would probably, you know, I never had a fusion, so I wouldn't know. But it, so let's level up. We've got a system. It's a system. It's got pros and cons, um, but you know, my job and my vision as for what I do in life is like, hey, let's try to like improve this. Let's give better options to people, whether it's hardware or software or just experience. Like let's improve as much as physically possible. Like let's not centralize power. Let's not centralize decision-making. Let's as much as possible improve my heart surgery with a seamless MD sort of product. I don't want to go back in the hospital because I screwed something up. Like, so that's what I'm all about. That's why I kind of do this at the end of the day. That's awesome. I really love you sharing that, that personal story. And, uh, um, you know, I, I do think, I mean, med tech's in really great hands with you because clearly you're, you're, you're driven to, to raise the bar for healthcare here in Canada and we need more of that. So, so thank you for doing that. Um, I know what we're getting to the hour and uh, we always do like uh, closing things off with our, with our lightning round. So maybe I'll let Alan uh, take it from here. Awesome. So uh, we have five questions for you, Robert. Um, basically the idea is answer them as quickly as you can, or, you know, as short as, as concise as you can. Um, first question is what is your favorite book or book you've gifted the most? So I'm not really a reader, but I'll tell you my favorite captain is Picard. Awesome. Oh, <laughs> Mine too. <laughs> there but, you wait, go. Wait, but, but who would be your number two if, if he was gone? Oh, man. <laughs> so it drops off. <laughs> it kind of drops off. I never really liked Kirk. I don't know. Uh, I, I never, never really liked Kirk. <laughs> probably, probably Riker or Data then, since they're number two and three. <laughs> Data, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, you, you got to trust the Android. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He was pissed in some of the shows and saying, why didn't you choose me as captain? Because I'm a robot or an android. He was pissed. Yeah. yeah. Uh, second question. Who is a person, either dead or alive, who you'd love to meet? Yeah, so I live in this city called Ottawa with the Can Can Canada's most valuable company. So, I mean, I'd love to meet some of those C-suites. So I'd say mm -hmm. Harley Finkelstein at this point. I'm super curious on how the hell these guys grew like that mm -hmm. behemoth of a company that's like, obviously global. Um, so that's my answer. So Robert, I got good news from you. Harley is an avid listener. <laughs> so we'll make sure to add him <laughs> when we tweet this out and make sure he doesn't miss this episode. I live in New Edinburgh also. We're pretty close. <laughs> oh, sweet. 
Um, all right, third question. Uh, what advice would you give yourself 10 years ago? Um, you know, again, back to my personal story, health is crazy important. Got to play the long game. So, I mean, minimizing risks. I know you're young. I know you think you're invincible, but, uh, you know, it's all about the long game. So, you know, try to be smart and, and don't play, you know, contact sports. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There you go. Uh, we were talking a little bit about this before the podcast started, but, uh, have you ever lost your shirt on an investment? Yeah. So when, uh, Bitcoin was, I was late to the Bitcoin game and I got on the train at the peak like a fool. Um, so I lost my, sh well, I didn't put a ton into it, but basically it's zero now, especially since Quadrica mm -hmm. happened, what happened there. Um, so I kept my, my coins in their wallet and obviously that's gone. So mm -hmm. that's my. Yeah. It's sad. Well, so you, you might go back to your 10 years ago self and maybe say, don't use that wall, <laughs> Bitcoin wallet. Like, that might be part yeah, of your, I, your. I hesitated. I was a bit lazy. I'm like, oh, should I do a cold wallet? I'm like, ah, oh, whatever. This is easier. And obviously, right. that was a bad choice. Are, 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 but that aside, would you like still be long Bitcoin today? Like in general? No, I think it's lost. Well, I haven't been paying attention anymore, but it seems to have lost its um, use case. Like I think people are optimistic before, but it, does, it doesn't seem like the the, the global uh, people prefer fiat and like even like the big payers like you know Stripe and even Shopify I don't think are really on board either just because they realized it's not a mass market thing. Well, maybe it will be, and it has it has uh, benefits, but right yeah. now they aren't clear. So pretty much any healthcare startup that tries to find a way to include Bitcoin as part of their, their thesis, stay away from Robert. Let me, let me quick uh, rant on that. I don't think, not Bitcoin, but blockchain, yeah. I think has value. Yeah. Like, don't get me wrong. But a lot of companies in healthcare say, I have this blockchain enabled healthcare X. I think that's the wrong way to do it because at the end of the day, back to the workflow thing, like doctors couldn't care less about your blockchain. As long as it does something cool in the background you couldn't do before, fine. But it's not a selling point. It's not gonna fix a workflow. It might, but it's not going to be a selling point per se. It'll just be sort of early adopters, sort of, wow, this is cool. The late majority, which most of healthcare is, will just be like, okay, I'm scared of this, like whatever, does it do what I need to do? So Rob, I'm actually uh, on the same on the same note, I totally agree with you. And even when people talk about, you know, artificial intelligence and machine learning in healthcare, what I care about is like, well, what's the use case? Like what's the value creation for the customer? The customer doesn't care to use AI to get there. No, you, you know? don't. And that's why there was a huge bubble a year or two ago. So like AI was getting all the hype and all the VC cash. And then all of a sudden now it's a bit more sober, but at the end of the day, they're scared. So it's back to my CDSS, uh, clinician, clinician decision support uh, platforms. You can't go to market in health and saying, I have an AI something to fix, you know, glaucoma. You know, they're not gonna want it. They want, they're scared of that black box stuff. And so are the regulators. So you usually, well, this is a side topic altogether, but basically you gotta start with the sort of really dumb version and then put the smarts in or just not really emphasize it. But yeah, I mean, you know, new tech and health doesn't necessarily always mix. And that's sort of the dilemma and the hard part that us as sort of on the leading edge of things, you know, really have to worry about and like, are they going to want to actually pay for this thing? Definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, last question. It's a COVID-19 related question. Uh, what is one hobby or activity you've picked up since the pandemic started? So um, all those articles in the New York Times or whatever saying how parents have it tough is it's real. <laughs> So I uh, had a part-time daycare at home, <laughs> so to speak. But the one thing, like the one thing I started doing that I never did before was like I started doing my own car maintenance just because I wanted to oh, nice. uh, a side thing to do. Like it's nice to work with your hands once in a while mm -hmm. and it's, it's actually pretty easy. So yeah, I, I changed my own brakes for the first time ever. Mm. Was that all YouTube education or? Exactly. And I downloaded yeah. the manuals and then it's, actually really easy it's kind of a, it's kind of a, cr a crime that we pay for this sort of stuff but hey yeah. <laughs> I, I just i just had this this kind of uh funny bad thought about someone who who who, who started looking at surgery the same way during the pandemic if, if someone, <laughs> uh you know what i'm just gonna pick up surgery and i'm gonna do it myself and, and not have to to spend dollars on it. that's probably a bad idea <laughs> but fixing um, your car is totally fine <laughs> 
that would be pretty hardcore. That would be a lot of vocal <laughs> anesthesia and yeah. uh, a lot of uh, a lot of courage. Definitely. Just hope you don't lose your blood pressure while you're doing it. Oh God. But if you're but if you're going to do it, please uh, work with Seamless. We'll make sure that that you're taken care of afterwards, assuming you make yeah. it. <laughs> That's an awesome way to cap it off, Josh. There you go. Thank you. Good tie in. Awesome. Well, Robert, thank you so much for being on the show. Um, if people do want to get in contact with you, where should we direct them? Yeah, robert.ridlop at medtech.ca. I'm on LinkedIn. I, I'm trying to be a little bit more active, but all of those public channels, happy to chat. Uh, we're always looking for new sort of companies that are great and doing innovative things. I'm an open book. Um, otherwise, I wouldn't be doing a good job. And, you know, so... Uh, you know, feel free to reach out. We're looking for new companies all the time. Uh, we're open for business. We have money to spend. Uh, and let's elevate healthcare up here in Canada. Amazing. Awesome. Thank you so much, Robert. Really appreciate you taking the time. And I'm sure our viewers are going to really gonna enjoy this one as well. My pleasure. I hope, I hope they do too. Awesome. All right. Bye, Robert. See you, Robert. Bye.